Okay. Thermodynamics. The exams, huh? Maybe they'll be done in a couple months. I don't know. <laughs> no. I'm way behind. I enjoyed my Easter break way too much. So. Anyway, so we're talking about thermodynamics. Any situation, which pretty much is every situation, it involves energy transfer. And you can use these laws that we're going to talk about to see how, you know, what's, what's allowed, what's not. And just pretty much what's spontaneous, what's natural, and what's unnatural. Um, that's pretty much what thermodynamics is all about. Okay. The uh, first law of thermodynamics, you can never get something for nothing. Or the work output can never be greater than the work input. Okay. I, this little picture, Kelly, is from the Smithsonian Museum. I should have a little s caption under there. And those little, it's a perpetual motion machine. And, I, and these little guys, that they, they just keep going around and around and around. Can't really see that. All right, just keep spinning on you. So my question to you is, according to the first law, perpetual motion, perpetual motion machines are Where's Kelly? Pick on Kelly. I don't even see Kelly. There she is, Kelly. What would you say? It's in the Smithsonian. The little guy's spinning. What would you say? Right? Perpetual motion machine means that once you get that guy spinning, he's never going to stop, right? You have to look at this really, really close. And right there. Can you see it? It's, a pl it's plugged in! <laughs> right? It has to be impossible. You can't get something for nothing, right? You've got friction and all this stuff. <laughs> so, it's kind of funny. I don't know. You think they would have a big sign saying, hey, this is plugged in, this is impossible. But, okay. Mathematics really describes our world, right, Crystal? We have delta U equals Q plus W. Do you recognize any of these variables? I think you should recognize one of them. Ooh, yeah, I guess you'd recognize two of them. Delta would be one. Delta means change, but... Which one was heat? Q. That, there's heat. So that's the same heat, the same Q that we were calculating before. How much energy does it take to boil water? We calculated a Q. Okay. Bianca, do you recognize any of these other ones or from the reading? Now, Jesus said delta means change. He's right. Delta U or W? Anybody? Work is W. w. There's work. And then delta U is change in, yeah, change in energy. Except they're, gonna, they're not going to say energy. Change in, well, they say energy. But does a second word change in internal energy? The reason why they're making a big stink out of this is because what this is all about is a system, and a, a system is just something that's you know contained. You know you can identify it and make measurements. For example, uh, I don't know. There's a bottle of water, right? Israel's got a bottle of water in here. That's your system. Right? Everything inside this bottle of water is your system. Okay? Well, you've got liquid molecules, you've got some gas molecules, right? You've got a temperature of the thing. Internal energy is all forms of the total energy, but all forms. Because if you think about it, you've got little molecules flying around. Well, there's kinetic energy going on there. You've got little molecules spinning. Well, there's rotational energy. They've got vibrational energy. 
there's all this, there's different forms of energy. The energy inside the bonds. So internal energy is just all forms of energy, all added up. So the only way to change internal energy is through heat or work. Okay. That's how you change internal energy. Okay, so that's those. What are the units of all this stuff? What are the units? Remember, Danielle? What are the units? Joules. Right, because heat was always in joules or kilojoules. So everything needs to be in joules, everything needs to be in kilojoules. Right? Jalen. I'm going to push on this. Jalen. I'm pushing on this guy. Right? I'm an old man, so I bet in about five minutes I'm going to start sweating. Right? Am I doing any work? Sweating. There's no distance. Is it kind of a trick question? Physicists say they're the everything. They probably are. <laughs> but anyway, work is force times distance. If you didn't move this object, if I did not move that chalkboard, technically I did not do any work. Okay. So that's work. Some, something actually has to move to do work. But that's above and beyond what you need to know. But I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, F is force. F equals ma. Remember that one? Mass times acceleration. Anyway, that's way beyond what you need to know. So that's the first law. Delta U equals Q plus W. If they ask you what the first law is, it's the easiest way is just to write the equation. Changing them to internal energy is the heat plus the work. Okay. The second law. It's based on human experience. Rocks fall. Hot frying pans cool down when taken off a hot stove. Iron rust. Tires punctured and high pressure air shoots out to its lower pressure surroundings. Ice melts in a warm room. What does all this stuff, Pamela, have in common? Mm, what's that? Aren't they losing? Yeah, yeah, well, well, think of it this way, though. She said losing energy. One thing that you have to get used to is this whole system idea. Like hot frying pans cool down when taken off a hot stove. Think of it that way. So your system is the whole kitchen. So you take the hot frying pan off the hot stove, right? The hot frying pan starts cooling down, heats up the air around it. The total energy doesn't go away. The total energy stays the same if that's your system. Unless your system is the frying pan, and that's it, well, then it's losing heat. So it kind of depends on how you identify your system when you talk about energy. But we're close. They are all, they're all, it's an S word. Oh, it's down below. They're all spontaneous. They're all natural. So you could use the word spontaneous or natural would be the best descriptor of this. Right? They all happen on their own. But do you see the next one? Energy is not so much increased or decreased. Because again, that's, that's how you def identify your system, whether it stays the same, increased or decreased. It's not really that. We don't want to play the game of what's the system. The energy just is just more like uh, I, maybe the, ob the more obvious one is puncturing the tire. The hot frying pan, you put it on here, and the heat disperses out into the tabletop. The energy just gets more equilibrated, kind of spread out, is what I'm thinking. Right? That the, you have all this high pressure in the tire, you puncture it, and it's all kind of concentrated in that one inside the tire, all that energy is. But then if you puncture it, it's a natural process for stuff to get spread out. Right? The, the ice melts. Right? The, the, 
the water gets warm and starts running down the sides, right? It, it gets spread out. The energy gets distributed. So, I don't know, however, what, whatever word I think I'm trying to say is distributed or spread out. Uh, disper dispersed is probably good because dispersed sounds random. I like the word dispersed. Dispersed to me sounds random, and that's what you want. Okay, so the textbook describes the second law. You just have to circle the right word here. Desiree, for any blank process, this is how the book describes the second law. For any spontaneous process. And Halica, the blank must always increase. There's a weird one. Not energy. Because energy, remember, if you think of this, the energy increasing, decreasing idea is pretty much always thrown out. Because if you just make your system the universe, then energy is always constant. Doesn't matter what you pick, right? So none of the answers are in this thermodynamics thing that is really energy increasing or decreasing. Because that delta U, if you make the system, you hold the universe. For any spontaneous process, the blank must always increase. Something we haven't really talked about yet. It's entropy. It's entropy. A very odd concept, OK? So let's take a closer look at what entropy is. Israel, does ice melt in a warm room? Yeah, OK. So it's spontaneous. It happens on its own. Marlena, will the cold water molecules give energy to the warm air molecules, or do the warm air molecules give energy to the cold water molecules. Yeah, exactly. And we're used to this. We're used to all these natural processes happening all the time. Energy, we're just used to energy getting spread out. Stuff goes from hot to cold. And that's just entropy. Let's spread out this energy. Let's disperse it. Okay? And you can't stop that from happening. That's the that's the second law. If, uh, is there a lot of energy in the ocean? Right? There has to be, right? Because it's, uh, it's all liquid water. Could you suck out that heat and shoot out ice cubes out the back of a ship, make it go? Now, why not use that energy? You know, with engineering, we can do anything. Is it a natural process to suck heat out of water and have ice cubes shoot out. It's just the exact opposite of what's natural. It's the exact opposite of entropy. You'd have to do work to get that done. It ain't going to work. So you don't even, engineers don't even try that problem. You don't even attempt it because thermodynamics tells you that. Forget it. It ain't going to work. You're wasting your money and time. OK. Entropy, or delta S, is a measure of how spread out the, hmm, Ashley, how would you answer that? Yeah, there's the best answer. You could probably argue a lot of these, because joules is joules, right? The problem is, is there's different types of energy, right? There's heat. Heat's one type of energy. But if you take into account all the different forms of energy, okay, you spread out that energy, man. It doesn't matter what the form is. Just spread out the energy. That's internal. It's the best way to describe it. So we're just kind of playing around with the terminology. Now this, the third law, is so that we can actually do some problems. So that we can actually make some calculations, do some predictions, and actually use some math to solve some problems. You need a baseline. The third law of thermodynamics, a crystal with no imperfections at zero Kelvin has an entropy of, what would you guess? Perfect crystal. Zero Kelvin. It's as cold as you theoretically can get it. Just how dispersed is the energy? Zero. They just it could, you could make it be six if you want, but the point is, is 
we need a baseline for everything. And then we're going to measure from the baseline. It's kind of like height. If you want to measure my height, you got to start from somewhere, right? You could measure my height from the physical ground, but that's not tradition. Tradition is to measure the height from the bottom of my foot to the top of my head. Right? But as long as if we everybody measured their height from on this floor to the physical ground, we it makes sense. Right? Gloriana is still taller than I am. There's nothing I can do about it, right? So you just have to, everyone has to agree with the same baseline. And that's what we're doing with the third law. OK. So we're getting close to working some problems here and making some predictions, which is really what we're after, trying to predict as well as we can what the heck nature's doing. Monica, we've got another equation. Do you recognize any of these? The T is, ooh, it's a good guess. Not time, but temperature. Big T is temp. How about another one? Do you recognize any of them? Brittany, recognize any other variables? Change in. Yeah, change in heat. But we didn't. We used a, a technical word for heat here. Change in enthalpy. enthalpy. It's just heat. You're right. But it's heat exchanged under constant pressure. We called it enthalpy. A couple more. Gloriana, delta G or delta S? Delta S is entropy. Yeah. Well, it has it. Delta in front, so we technically should say change in entropy. All right, you're left with, hey Zeus, you're left with delta G. Change in, it's the name of a dude, starts the G. Hmm. Yeah. Ooh, say it louder. Change in Gibbs free energy. Change in Gibbs free energy. There's nothing free about it, so I don't know why they call it free, but OK. Change in Gibbs. What would their units be? I guess the only, well, you have a hint. What was delta H? Yeah, joules or kilojoules, right? So that means everything's got to be in joules or kilojoules. Or it could be joules per mole. It could be joules per mole, too. Right? If it's in joules per mole, or kilojoules per mole, then delta G has to be in kilojoules per mole. If you want delta H to be in kilojoules, well, then delta G would have to be in kilojoules, right? Because they're the same. OK. This guy is going to be kind of weird. Delta S, his units, they have to be joules over Kelvin, because you have to get the temperature units to cancel. right? So delta S is the one who's going to have some different units on them. It would be joules per Kelvin or kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay. When what is less than zero, the process, Jacqueline, is going to be natural or spontaneous. Which of those variables? This is where it all comes into play. Wow, this reaction is going to happen. It's because it is negative. It's anybody? Not temperature. In fact, temperature can't be, because temperature is that, on that Kelvin scale. The lowest number you can get is zero. It's going to be delta G. delta G. Gibbs free energy. That's the one that we're going to go by all the time to see if something's going to be spontaneous or not. What do you think about this one? Brad, how are we going to get numbers for all this stuff? to get a delta G, and well, if it's negative, ooh, it's spontaneous. How you can get numbers for this stuff to do the math? Predetermined experiments, charts. Charts, tables, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. We're just going to use tables. So we'll figure that out. We'll see how, where they're coming from. So we'll look up numbers for all this stuff. A reaction is more likely to be spontaneous. OK, this is a good one. Kelly, so take a close look at this equation this equation here. Clean this up. A reaction 
Look at that equation. A reaction is more likely to be spontaneous. In other words, that delta G is going to be negative if it is exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic, right? Because then delta H is negative. Delta H is less than zero. You want delta G to be less than zero. So exothermic, yeah, that's really going to help. So more than likely, if it's going to be spontaneous, it's going to be exothermic. The change in entropy crystal, delta S should be what? Positive or negative? If you want delta G to be negative, delta S better be, what does the equation tell you? If delta S is negative, then you have a negative times a negative. That'd be making that'd be going the wrong way. So you want delta S to be positive, right? You want there to be positive changes in, en in entropy. And what does that mean? Again, that just means that, yeah, final minus initial entropy states, energy is dispersed. Energy is much more spread out. Final minus initial entropy states. And the reaction occurs at a Bianca, what temperature? At a high temperature, right? Because what are the units of the temperature? It has to be Kelvin. So that means it's going to be high temperature. How do you get Kelvin? If I'm at 20 degrees Celsius, whatever the homework question is, add 273, add 273 and you'll have Kelvin. Exactly. That'd be what? 293 Kelvin. Notice there's no degree symbol. It's just big K. That's how you get Kelvin. Simply by looking at a reaction, can you tell if the change in entropy will be positive or negative for that reaction? This is a tough question. Let's see if I have an example here. Here's an example right down here. And we'll actually do the, the question. But all you do is you, look, you want things to be dispersed. So you look at the change in gas molecules. If, you have, if you're producing more gas molecules than what you started out with, ooh, delta S is going to be positive. Huge change in entropy. That's all you really do. How many gas molecules do I have on the product side? I have how many gas molecules? Two, right? Just two CO2 molecules. Don't count the water because it's a liquid. So two on the product side. How many on the reactant side? Four. Four. So my change in entropy is not going to be positive. I'm, it's going to be a really negative number because I'm losing gas molecules. Energy is going to be much less dispersed. It's going to be more concentrated because I have less gas molecules. That's how, you, that's how you answer this question. You just look at the gas molecules on both sides. And if you're producing a lot of gas, ooh, delta S is positive. The energy is going to be really dispersed. If you're not producing very much gas or less gas than what you start out with, delta S would be negative. Energy would be more concentrated in a smaller area. Okay. On the yeah, on both sides. So on the product side, I have two gas molecules, and the reactant side, two gas molecules. On the product side, I, I think they said I had four, right? So I'm, I'm losing gas molecules. And that's because the reason why you pick on gas and nothing else, because gas takes up all the space. You don't really care about solids or liquids because they're already so tiny. Their volume, they're about the same volume no matter what. It's the gas molecules that matter. So since we're, we have less gas molecules, uh, delta S will be definitely less than zero. So let's try it. OK. Let's try it. In this question, 18.43, find delta S0 for the reaction. See table 18.1 for values. OK. So what we need to do, and hopefully we'll get a negative number. The reason, what's this little 0 doing here? It's not a degree. It's not initial. It's STP, typo, standard temperature and pressure. And they're always going to have that little zero on there. The reason why is because that standard temperature and pressure, 
25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, something like that. The point is, is if you're not at that standard temperature and pressure, you can't use the tables of all these delta S numbers that we're going to take a look at. So you have to be at the standard temperature and pressure, otherwise you can't use the tables. So they're always going to have a little zero on this stuff. You're going to see little zeros on, whoop, on the delta H's. You're going to see little zeros on the delta G's, because there's tables of all this stuff. And if that little zero isn't there, that means you're not at standard temperature and pressure, you can't use the table. Okay. So don't let the little zero bother you. It should kind of actually make you feel better. Hey, I get to use the table. Okay. Yeah, we have right now we have no idea. So let's look it up. Let's Do you hear Brittany's question? What are the delta S is going to be? We're going to calculate it. it's going to be some number. What are the units? Well, let's let the table tell us. All right? So let's find uh, if you have a book, I didn't scan that. I'm going to have to scan it next time. If you have a book, great. Otherwise, I'm going to have to cheat and get my exam for handout here. Hopefully it's there. All right? See. Oh, you know what? Let's hand out my book so that Jacqueline can find the table. Because if I can't find it, maybe you can. Okay. Oh, I've got some here. It's yes. Yes. If you have, yes. Let's. It, I think this will make. Oh, she found it. Thank you. Okay, Jacqueline found it. So this is how what you're going to need to do the homework. You have. If they want you to find delta S for a reaction, you have to look up delta S. Because what does delta mean again? Change. Change. But what minus what? Yeah, final minus initial, which in this case is products minus reactants, right? So you have to look up the delta S for all the products. Minus the delta S for all the reactants. Whoop, reactants, there's the R. Because it's final minus initial. Okay, so products minus reactants. So I'm going to look it up for... CO2 first. And Brad's right. I got to find the CO2 with a G on it. Because CO2 with a little S on it, you know what that is? They sell it at HEB Marketplace, where all the Jaguars are. And the Beamers. Out there by Incarnate Word, that really fancy HEB. Just, <laughs> just go walk. It's an amazing place. Just walk through their parking lot. I've never seen Jaguars and Right? It's really nice. Right? And they have a lot of free samples in that one. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's the only HEB that I know of that sells CO2 solid. Better known as dry dry ice. Right? So I bet you CO2 solid is in this table. You don't want to find the delta S for CO2 solid. You want to find the the delta S for CO2 with a gas. All right, so Pamela, let's see. Here's carbon. So she's looking under carbon. And there's CO2 with a gas. Oh, they don't have CO2 with a solid, so we don't have to worry about it. The delta S number is what? Okay, so you got to read that to me. It's, she said it's 213.7. What are the units? All right, because Brittany's got a good question. We don't need to memorize them. Joules over moles times Kelvin. Okay. So that's what CO2 gas is. But how many CO2 gases do I have? Two, two of them. So I better multiply that number times two. I guess I got to make bigger columns here. Okay, I've got two of those. And I've got two H2O liquids, so let's hand it over to Christina. We need to find H2O liquid. I have no idea where it is. Maybe it's under oxygen. It is under oxygen. It's H. Now, don't give me H2O gas. Give me H2O liquid. 
95. And I have how many of these? Two. Two of them. OK. Now, do I do plus or minus here? Plus, because I have to find a delta H for all the products. That's it, right? I have no more products left. Oh, we should write them in. Same thing. Joules over moles Kelvin. Sorry. I forgot. I should have put them in. OK, minus the reactants now. OK, let's hand it to, uh, bring it to the back here. Marcus, got to wake you up. I need the S for C2H4 and it has to be gas. I don't know where it is. Look under carbon maybe or something. C2H4. There it is. You found it. OK. What is that number? 219.2 joules per mole Kelvin. OK, and I only have one of those, so I'm not going to multiply it by anything. Plus, you can hand it, out, hand it on over to, uh, I don't know, Crystal or somebody back there. We need uh, O2 gas, three of them. O2 gas, 205. OK. need three of them. OK, so R delta S is, I got figured out. Okay. Did you get like negative 267 or so? Yes, 267. Man, you guys are going to get so wet. Then is it still joules over It has to be. Because that's the only way you can, that's one thing to get used to. It's, if you want to add two numbers, you have to have exactly the same units. Yeah, so everything has to have joules over moles Kelvin. Oh, well, you don't, you're just going to go by the table every single time, right? This is all you have to work with are these tables. So if the table gives it to you in kilojoules per mole Kelvin, well, then you'll be in kilojoules per mole Kelvin. It worked because of the gas molecule. So we just verified it. Okay. It is a big negative number. Our little prediction worked. There's going to be some homework like this one, where it says, for each of the following reactions, state whether the reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous, or is easily reversible. That is something that has significant amounts of reactants and products. OK. Here's the first one. There's a reaction, and I give you the delta G0 for it. So at under standard temperature and pressure conditions, you know what delta G is. Does that look like a, who am I picking on here? Danielle, does that look like a, this first one, C, does that look like a spontaneous reaction, non-spontaneous, or easily reversible? What's the game plan for this? Do you have one? It's non-spontaneous because, because it's not negative. All right. You agree? What would be a uh, what would be the answer to D? It's non-spontaneous again. How about uh, E? Now they're getting. This is the one where they're supposed to say, "Ooh, I'm getting close to zero." 
I'm not into the hundreds anymore. So I'm getting close to zero. Zero is that mixture of high of both, easily reversible. So I think E, the best answer would probably be easily reversible because you're close to zero. All right. Any numbers you know, between 10 and negative 10, I would say easily reversible. Uh, it's not really spontaneous. It's not really non-spontaneous. It's appreciable amounts of reactants and products. So you just look at delta G. That's all you do is look at delta G. Or calculate it if they didn't give it to you, which is what this one is about. Calculate delta H and delta G for the following reactions at 25 degrees Celsius. Interpret the signs of delta H and delta G. Okay. So again, you like seeing that little superscript zero because that means what? You use the tables. It's always going to be products minus reactants. And then how would you do this part about interpreting the signs? Yeah, it's either negative or positive. So it could be negative or positive for the delta H or the delta G. What's the, interp what's the, bless you, what's the interpretation of that? Like, for example, delta H is positive. You're close. Mm, yeah, you're close. Pick one. Like, delta H is positive. That means, what word did we attach to that? And, yeah, delta H is enthalpy, but if delta H is positive, ooh, not exothermic, endothermic, right? If delta H is positive, you're supposed to say endothermic. Heat is absorbed. If delta H is negative, the best answer is exothermic, or you could say heat is given off, right? If delta G is positive, you're supposed to say, someone said it. You're supposed to say, if delta G is positive, the interpretation is non-spontaneous. If delta G is negative, spontaneous. If delta G is approximately zero, easily reversible. Those are your choices. Okay. So I think you have an idea how to do this one, right? Okay. So that means you have to find the delta H table to do find delta H zero, the delta G table to find delta G zero. Oh, that's it. All right. And since no one has their book, so I can't really ask you to do it. So, you better run before you get soaked. <laughs>